Now, one of the things that's going to happen, as I shared with you in the previous presentation, is that there is the uh, spiritual conquest of Mexico that went along with the material conquest. The Christianization of native peoples, it occurred first in central Mexico under a system known as corregimiento. Uh, basically was native communal agricultural lands that were controlled by the crown and protected by the church, especially against the encomienda and repartimiento systems. Um, the, the Christianization of native peoples uh, was very successful. And basically what happened was, uh, especially in the chinampa system or in the agricultural system that native peoples had, and, uh, the, the native communal agricultural lands, the church just established itself right next to those native communal agricultural lands. And so the crown, in essence, through the church, controlled those, those rich agricultural lands. Meanwhile, there's the private landowners that are shared with you through the encomienda system, and then when the Franciscans rebelled against the, the uh, slave system that had developed out of encomienda, then there was a repartimiento. But nonetheless, it was still the enslavement of native populations. So there's going to be a struggle between um, the church as well as private interests, and that struggle is constant to this day. Now, missions, why missions were so important in the conquest, quote-unquote, in the takeover, in the colonial settlement pattern, is that missions helped uh, uh, in the process of changing native peoples into Spanish-speaking workers. Okay? And the idea was to introduce religious instruction. Uh, and when you take a look at a mission system, um, the, you know, native peoples now are going to be incorporating uh, a new religion. So there's going to be new foods, new prayers, uh, new names. And so whenever you went into a mission system, um, alongside your uh, agricultural field products of corn, beans, squash, whatever else that you had in your fields, now you're going to bring in new sources of food, new sources of energy. So bringing in these uh, uh, techniques, native peoples are going to appreciate uh, the new gifts by understanding and appreciating the new religion that's providing these new gifts. So you have to provide, there's going to be new occupational productions. Uh, you have to provide in the mission, you have to provide technical guidance for these new occupational productions, such as crafts, such as weaving, uh, candle making, and most importantly, wineries. Um, again, the celebration of the Eucharist requires uh, the growing of grapes and then eventually the making of wines. And this is one of the reasons why uh, in Latin America there are these great wineries all the way up here into California, these great wineries. But what basically, <clears throat> when you move, move into a mission system, you're introducing not just religious instruction, but also providing technical guidance for new occupations. And then most importantly, there's, there's livestock, livestock raising. So you have to learn animal husbandry. The mission system uh, is about that. Uh, how, how to, uh, you're introducing cattle, you're introducing horses, you're introducing sheep, goats. Um, you're introducing roosters, chickens, et cetera. So this livestock, you have to learn animal hub husbandry. Um, so a mission, a mission, when you walked into a mission, when you looked into a mission, you took a look at, you have to understand and appreciate this is a, a, an economic enterprise. Uh, and so Native peoples are going to be celebrating uh, this new enterprise uh, by using uh, the new musical instruments simply because they're going to incorporate the religion. They will... Uh, amalgamate different aspects of their religion. As I shared with you, the majority of people accommodate and adapt. And those who accommodate and adapt are going to balance the demands of their outside world with their rich heritage. And so they will uh, begin to uh, syncretize or create a syncretic culture that adjusts Spanish traditions to native traditions. And in this syncretic culture, in the, in the creation of the syncretic culture, this is where we get uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe, and this is where we get music such as mariachi. Um, uh, the, using the new musical instruments, the fiddle, the accordion, the harps, the harpsichords, and the guitar. Uh, all of this was very important with regards to uh, the mission and the settlement. Now, 
priests are going to maintain a central mission at a key site, and then they'll initiate visits to outlying villages. And in this way, an area would uh, be important. Now, the success in central Mexico leads to incorporating the mission system as part of the movement north, as part of the idea of going and, and colonizing up in the north, especially after the reconnoitering adventurers came back and said that there is wealth up north. So there is this search for wealth. Spain is obsessed in trying to uh, find the wealth that was recorded with regards to native peoples and their stories of ho the Hohokam, of the Anasazi, of the Mogollon, of the Mississippian cultures up in the north. So the success in central Mexico of transforming native peoples into Spanish-speaking workers, they want to incorporate the mission system right, as part of the move north. And so you send missionized native peoples with priests to accompany colonists who are going to be protected by military squadrons. Okay? And so this was the plan. Now, the first attempt at colonization is going to be presented to the vice royalty in Mexico City by an ambitious entrepreneur named Juan de Oñate. And so this is the first attempt. This is the first colony. Now, this particular man is uh, uh, very important to appreciate because he had dreams of becoming another Hernán Cortés. He will use his vast mineral holdings in Zacatecas to finance an adventure that he uh, so much wants to uh, enter into. His wealth derived from the use of native peoples as slaves in the mines. Um, just like Cortés, he was ruthless, he was very calculating, he was shrewd. Now, now, one of the things about colonization efforts, leading, if you're going to lead a colonization effort up to the north, only peninsulares and criollos were allowed to lead such schemes to create a colonial settler society up in the north, to create what will become a new Mexico, a new Mexico, a Nuevo Mexico up in the north. So for him, he needs to establish himself as a criollo. So he hid his mestizo origins, and he presented himself as a Spanish noble. So he hid his mestizaje, in a cloak of prosperity, and it fooled the audiencia. Now, the, colo the, the colony, <laughs> here my, my, my Mexican's coming out. The colony that Oñate organized consisted of a hodgepodge of castas. It consisted of peninsulares, consisted of criollos, of mestizos, of indios, of negros, from different regions of central Mexico. He is organizing and going to finance this experience. So the crown is saying, let's go, let's go for it. The colony is going to be well equipped uh, with provisions, uh, and the military is going to uh, be equipped or maintained with the latest weapons of mass destruction. And so they're not going to go uh, uh, naked and alone. They're going to go with protection. Uh, now, the church is going to go with him. So here is a material conquest along with a spiritual conquest. They're coming together. The church is going to be represented by several Franciscans and missionized native peoples. So you have a hodgepodge of castas. You have a military squadron. You have uh, uh, Franciscans and then native peoples who are already speaking Spanish. They've already been missionized. Okay, so although the cardinal motive, again, was to move north was religious because ultimately the whole message, you have this, this uh, uh, humanitarian message of sending Jesus Christ to pagan idolaters. So in that sense, when you understand the religious uh, dimension to colonization, well, of course, of course, you have a religion that favors you. And, of course, 
with pagan idolaters, then you and your religion have every right to go and lay claim against pagans. It's very, very important. So although the cardinal motive to move north was religious, Juan de Oñate intended to create his own semi-feudal estate. He wanted to be king. So as they journeyed north, you can understand and appreciate, the hodgepodge collection of colonists are going to encounter, of course, in their mind, a very harsh environment. They're going to run into deserts. They're going to go through the Chihuahua Desert that starts just north of Zacatecas, goes into Durango, and up into today the state of Durango, and then up into the state of Chihuahua, and then up into West Texas, which is known as the Llano Estacado, and then New Mexico, which is known as the Red Deserts of New Mexico, hence Colorado or Colorado. Colorado means red. So as they journeyed north, this hodgepodge collection of colonists, of, 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 of military, of church, uh, are going to encounter settlements along the way from Durango through to Chihuahua. So they're entering an arid environment uh, where water is, is, the, is the commodity, is the precious resource for survival. You need water. So you need water, and most importantly, food. And so as they move north, they're necessarily going to extract the water and the food that they could from local villages along the way, from subsistence economies along the way. So the peoples that are going to be encountering this great group that's moving up north, um, they are going to send message to people up north to expect a group that's coming in that's going to take their foods and water. And as they reach what will be referred to as El Rio Bravo del Norte, which they will call, eventually everybody will call it the Rio Grande, or the Great River. As they reach that, they're going to encounter groups of Piros, Tompiros, Seneca, and Thanos, who are living along the riverbanks of the river, okay? or of this Rio Bravo del Norte. So, seeing such a large contingent approach from afar, and then hearing stories of horror, of deceit, of thievery from messengers sent from the south, many in the region are going to abandon their sites and they're going to seek refuge in various locations above the riverbanks. So it is recorded that colonists are going to seize food and now this is the this is the colonists coming in from Chihuahua they're going to run into El Rio Bravo del Norte, the Rio Grande. They're going to run into it. And so as they run into it, the peoples who are living there, the Piros, the Tompiros, the Seneca, um, they are going to abandon their sites. And so their agricultural fields are going, to be, are going to have food for the colonists. The colonists are going to take that, and they're going to very quickly cross uh, uh, the river in a very favorable location that they will identify on the day that they arrived as San El Ciario, which is the, the saint's day for the day that they arrived. Today it's pronounced as San Elisario today. And they're going to feast before continuing the journey north. But they were able to, uh, over in San El Ciario, today in San Elisario, they're able to ford across the river uh, because there's a favorable place right there in San Eli where you can just walk across the river and then underneath these trees they will have a picnic of the field products that were taken from the Piros and the Piros lands that they're there. Meanwhile, the native peoples are just watching this contingent as they're going to be moving north. Now... Um, People in El Paso today uh, go all out in informing Americans that the first Thanksgiving occurred uh, 35 miles south of the downtown El Paso today in 1587. This is in 1587. And so, of course, 
This is uh, many years before the 1621 pilgrim experience of the first Thanksgiving. So El Paso likes to share with uh, tourists that the first Thanksgiving uh, eventually occurred in what will become the United States in El Paso, Texas. So that's a great way to kind of bring tourists into El Paso uh, to help in their economy. Uh, in fact, in the late 1990s, the El Paso City Council wanted to honor these brave colonists who came into the quote-unquote wilderness to bring civility to the savages. So the idea is, of course, when did the first civilization arrive uh, in the United States? The council, El Paso City Council, is going to commission an artist to make a statue of Juan de Oñate and to many of the other conquistadores that, or, that went through this this uh, uh, area in El Paso, uh, one was for Coronado, but the city council decided let's give credit first, let's set aside some monies to honor Juan de Oñate, uh, to honor Europe, to honor the Spanish, to honor the civilization, and of course to attract tourists to El Paso because El Paso's economy in the 1990s needed uh, some kind of um, uh, enhancement. So the council commissioned this artist but the expenses of this publicly financed endeavor kept mounting and mounting and mounting, and several more years were needed to complete the first phase of, very, of a very ambitious project. And during this time, local native peoples mounted a campaign to stop the project and to, get, and to educate El Paso City Council and the public of Juan de Oñate's true character. He was an inept administrator, he was a ruthless murderer who meted out justice with a sword. So, after the colonists had uh, uh, left uh, San El Ciario, after they finished eating, then they went back across and went up further north, about another 35 miles. And as they came to, wanting to move further north, they came to uh, another riverbed, another pass, and as they went through that pass on the river, that's what they will call El Paso del Norte, the pass. So they will move up, and then eventually they'll go around what is known today as the Franklin Mountains in El Paso, and then they'll start heading up northward uh, towards uh, eventually a place that we'll call Las Cruces, uh, the cross, and then further up north following the river through uh, the state of what is known today as New Mexico. Now, as they headed north, they're going to arrive in a, a, a community known as the Acoma. And the Acoma Pueblo, along the way up north, decided not to cooperate with the newcomers. They had already heard of these newcomers approaching, and as these newcomers are approaching, they're laying out, uh, they're, they're, they're creating environmental uh, disruption. Uh, there is uh, decertification that's occurring simply because the cattle and the horses require water. Water is a scarce resource. It's in a desert environment, yeah, and, and, and you have to live accordingly with regards to aridity. Aridity dictates uh, a different kind of experience uh, where you have to appreciate rain and you have to appreciate and you have to have a judicious use of water. And so these colonists are coming up, and uh, they're just leaving a trail behind with regards to uh, decertification, uh, destroying the desert. So the Acoma Pueblo community is going to decide not to cooperate with the newcomers. And as they resisted the colony, Oñate will pronounce harsh sentences to those who are captured. Men over 25 years of age are going to be condemned to have one foot cut off and enslaved for 20 years. Males between 12 and 25 and all females over 12 are to be enslaved for 20 years. Male children are to live under the command of Spanish officers and girls were turned over to the missionaries. So let's go to a film clip and that's from the Acoma Pueblo, actually from uh, some engineers who are attempting to appreciate uh, what happened in the past. The Acoma Pueblo is a Native American city located in New Mexico. It is estimated that the settlement has been around as far as 1,200 years ago, making it one of the longest continually inhabited settlements in North America. 
The people of this place are thought to have settled atop the mesa of which the city is built to defend themselves against other warring tribes existing in the surrounding area. This settlement has a rich history. Perhaps the most famous event is the Akuma Massacre perpetrated by the conquistador Juan de Añate. Juan de Añate was one of the last Spanish conquistadors. His objective was to colonize land and spread Catholicism throughout the northern frontier. In 1598, Juan attempted to reach the northern side of the Rio Grande Valley to create the first European settlement west of the Mississippi River. He would eventually found the Providence of Santa Fe de Nuevo Mexico, even serving as its governor for 12 years. Juan's expeditions into the north had eventually led him to come in contact with the people living atop the mesa at the Acoma Pueblo. Sometime after the initial contact with the Acoma, Juan ordered the act of obedience and homage to the Spanish crown. These such acts required the native people to give up certain provisions to the encroaching Spanish empire. The Acoma either didn't understand what the acts meant or they were angered by it. Either way, they resisted the orders and instead attacked and killed a small group of 11 Spaniards. Of the 11 Spaniards killed, one happened to include Juan de Añate's nephew, Captain Juan de Zavadar. Juan de Añate, angered by the assault on his people, led an attack on the Mesa in 1598, which lasted three days. At the end of the battle, 800 people lay dead and 500 more were captured by the soldiers under Juan's leadership. Following the fight, public trials were held for the surviving captives. It was decided that all males over 25 were to have one foot cut off and serve a 20-year servitude. For the women and males over 12 but under 25, it was decided that they were also to serve 20 years in servitude. The remaining children under 12 were put into the care of the Franciscan missionaries close to the area. For the next 20 years, the unfortunate people of the Pueblo worked out their sentences on farms and ranches set up by the Spanish settlers. Eventually, after serving the harsh punishment, in 1620, the survivors regrouped to rebuild the Pueblo in the sky, forever changed by the iron fist of Juan's Spanish empire. When news of Juan's actions reached King Philip of Spain, Juan was tried and found guilty of mismanagement and excessive cruelty. In 1614, Juan was banished from New Mexico and returned to Spain where he lived out the rest of his life. He died in Spain in 1626. Regardless of the pain... Okay, so that's uh, just... Uh, uh a little rendition from some engineers who are attempting to appreciate something about the Acoma Pueblo. Um, they got their history a little bit correct, uh, but um, let me just continue with this particular experience because as the Spanish continue their journey um, from the Acoma up north because they're looking for a spot, um, they're wanting to understand something about uh, the different trading centers uh, they just, in, in their journey up north, they miss Paquime, which is a, a, a very important uh, city-state that had existed just west of El Paso, uh, southwest of El Paso. They miss that place. And so as they're journeying up north, they're looking for uh, a, a, a major trading area, and they can't find it. So uh, as they continue their journey, they're going to establish uh, their first settlement across a river from a community that's called San Juan Pueblo today. It's some 25 miles of Santa Fe today um, in the San Juan Pueblo. By 1598, right, uh, the settlement patterns of the colony are going to reveal uh, seeds of discontent amongst all classes, all castes, and various native peoples, the native peoples of the area and those recruited from the south to come north. Now, let me just explain uh, the situation uh, uh, with regards to why uh, people are going to be discontent with Juan de Oñate. Now, first upon arrival, there's already precarious relations that existed between the Athapascan-speaking peoples who had, whose history was coming from the north into the region. Um, these Athapascan-speaking peoples we're just entering and settling in areas that are outside of the river, riverine uh, traditions of the Pueblos. The Pueblo people of the region are committed to irrigated agriculture. But irrigated agriculture in the sense that depending on water availability, and it's in a desert, uh, perhaps they had a settlement of five to seven years, and then they had other settlements uh, so usually a Pueblo, a Pueblo community is going to have two or three major settlements depending on the availability of water along the river, especially with regards to aridity. 
So the river, the, 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 the people who lived along the rivers are constantly, after five to seven years, probably moving maybe five miles further south or five miles further north uh, as they have their settlement, uh, as they have their different settlement patterns in an arid environment. Meanwhile, those who live outside the riverine areas are constantly in motion looking for water. So they'll probably have uh, uh, villages up in the mountains with regard where there, where there are springs, and then in the summer, probably field villages, okay? And then there's those who live in the deserts themselves that are constantly moving, searching for whatever the desert has to, uh, for survival. So aridity and the search for sustenance creates what is known as a transhumans pattern in the desert. Aridity and the search for sustenance at times is going to lead to conflict between and amongst them over use of available resources. So when the Spanish settlement arrives in New Mexico, the dynamic is, is that the Pueblos are living along the riverine areas and these Athapascan speaking peoples that we call Navajos and Apaches are going to be in the peripheral areas of the riverine system. So the Navajos and the Apaches are going to be in conflict with the Pueblos over food surpluses, okay? For foods for survival. So when the colonists arrive, they're naturally going to take over the precious resources. And that's going to lead to further conflict. So for the first few years, the colonists are going to introduce new food sources. And everyone is going to benefit from it because the new food sources and, 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 and the new ways of producing goods, well, there's uh, cows, horses, chickens, roosters, grapevines. Uh, then there's different seeds that are going to be introduced uh, from the, for, the new, for the gardens, outside of your corn, beans, and squash, now you can add lentils, onions, leeks, garlic, anise, pepper, mustard, mint, melons, watermelons, and then perhaps maybe some trees were brought of pear, apple, quince, mulberry, pecan, peach, apricot, plum, pomegranate, fig, whatever it is that is that's going to be sent up north for this colony to survive. So missions are equally going to entice native peoples into creating a new lifestyle. So you can imagine all of the interactions that are going to be occurring at the beginning. Native peoples have their own ceremonies for water because the key to survival is access to water. People have to search for water. Water is important. One of the most important features of living in aridity is migration. So if you live in a fixed settlement for a prolonged period of time, it can spell disaster, especially in an arid environment. One has to move where the water is. So after several years of living in the region, the colonists themselves are going to begin to rebel against the conditions of the settlements. Why? Because water, you have to, you have to move to find the water. And of course, the, the colonists are not going to be able to survive in an arid environment. The Pueblos, the Navajos, the Apaches, they're surviving. That's their environment. The colonists are having difficulty surviving. So many of the colonists, after living several years uh, in, in living in the region, they will rebel because of their inability to live in an arid environment. So many are going to request to leave the colony and head back to Mexico City. Oñata says no. Not, not yet. We don't, we're not with the Pueblo Revolt yet. Oñata says no. Oñata will sentence deserters to death. And those who escape to Mexico City are going to inform the Audencia, and they're going to inform a military regiment that's going to be sent to escort Oñata back to Mexico and face the Audencia. You can bring it full force because El Paso, uh, I, I, I deliberately did this so I can get back to understanding what happened in El Paso. But uh, Oñate, when he reaches Mexico City, is going to be forced to resign. And it is as his resignation that the vice royalty will find that he forged his birth certificate. Now, when El Paso City Council is informed of Oñate's ruthlessness and his violation of human rights, the city council is going to be convinced 
to change the name of Juan de Oñate, uh, this particular statue, that this is, and this statue is very important if you take a look at it, because it, it is in El Paso, Texas. When you, when you arrive in uh, the El Paso International Airport in El Paso, Texas, you will encounter this statue. And so they changed the name of the statue from Juan de, honoring Juan de Oñate to honoring the horse. Now it's called the equestrian. All right? And this was El Paso's contribution to uh, honoring uh, uh, the Spanish civility, um, but it was the horse that was important that brought significant change. Okay, so that, <laughs> that um, uh, lays to rest Juan de Oñate. Juan de Oñate was a very, very interesting character.